Uh, let's get right into it. Here's what we know about uh, when we talk about business acumen. Uh, every single day, managers, leaders in, in organizations, large and small, uh, make decisions that impact the bottom line of their organization. Whether they realize it or not, they may think that the decisions are um, relatively local or relatively related to their functional area, but in some form or fashion, they're going to impact the bottom line of the organization. So are those decisions good ones? You, you certainly hope they are. But let's think about this. Um, how well do those managers, employees, sales teams, and so forth understand how that business that they work for measures success? Do they really understand how their decisions impact the bottom line? In fact, uh, we have learned to ask this, do they really understand what the bottom line is? I mean, certainly everybody knows what the bottom line is on, um, when we're talking about a financial statement, but there's a lot of uh, additional equally important numbers and ratios that uh, make up key metrics. Do they understand what those are? In other words, do they think like owners? I think any organization would uh, be thrilled if it could think that every employee, every manager made decisions and thought through um, issues as though they owned a piece of that organization. So I would ask each of you listening today to think about uh, the company each of you works for. And then think about everybody in, in your organization who manages someone or is a key contributor. What percentage of those people know how your company measures success, what the key metrics are? And what percentage of them know what affects those metrics? And then how many of them think about those key measurements when making decisions? So understanding how your company keeps score and how each individual can impact the score, that really, in essence, is business acumen. A more formal definition would be this. Uh, business acumen is an in-depth understanding of how a business works, how it makes money, and how strategies and decisions impact financial, operational, and sales results. Another way to say it might be uh, by using a sports analogy. Uh, in football, for instance, or in any sport, you have to know how you keep score. So in football, uh, how much is a touchdown worth? How much is a field goal worth? In business, we also keep score by using certain ratios and other metrics. In football, once you know how to keep score, then you devise strategies to impact that score or to improve your score. In the same way in business, uh, people with solid business acumen understand how strategies impact their company's financial metrics. Recently, Paradigm Learning surveyed dozens of learning and development and human resource leaders on this subject of business acumen and found some interesting results. First of all, we learned that uh, only 48% of those surveyed felt that members of their organization consider financial and strategic impacts of their choices when they make decisions. And 90% of those surveyed thought that there is an increased need for business acumen in their organizations. So everybody seems to understand almost intuitively that there's a need for this. So uh, what, do we do? What, what do we do about that? Well, without adequate uh, business acumen, managers are unable to align their priorities with those of the company, nor are they really able to help employees engage with the company's vision and the company's goals. If you multiply that by the hundreds or even thousands of employees that work for organizations, you, you recognize this gap in understanding the basics of the business, operating goals, and competitive comparisons. It means that too many decisions are being made, too many actions being taken that don't necessarily align with the business's core objectives. Managers with business acumen then are able to break down organizational silos. They're able to bridge communication gaps. They're able to engage employees that they manage. And that, of course, allows the entire workforce to understand how the company operates and how each person can contribute to the company's success. So improving business acumen leads to, to much more productive conversations among managers and also much more productive conversations between individual leaders and their team members. So rather than conversation stoppers like, uh, sorry, it's not in the budget or who knows why they won't let me hire somebody else. Those kinds of comments are replaced with uh, much more insightful, helpful, positive conversations. And those conversations make team members feel like they're part of a team moving in the same direction toward the same goal. 
not feeling like they're simply, you know, a helpless employee that's kept in the dark about these important issues. So who needs business acumen training? Well, we have been uh, designing and facilitating business acumen training all over the world for more than 20 years, and we've seen all of these groups benefit from that kind of training. Senior leaders, middle and low-level managers, high potentials, financial professionals, sales professionals, sales managers, technical professionals, team leaders, all of those and more. And, and I think uh, when I look at this list, I think of one additional anecdote that I recall from a couple of years ago that I think illustrates uh, the, the power contained in having this kind of knowledge. We had, uh, um, I, I believe his title was a team leader. He managed the mailroom at a Fortune 1000 organization. And routinely, requests would come into him, his department, to uh, send that company's annual report to a particular shareholder. And his thinking was, well, it's, it's the annual report. It's being requested by a shareholder. He just naturally overnighted it to, to the requesting party. After this class, though, he, he told us that he changed his thinking entirely because he started thinking about what was happening. Those people weren't requesting it overnight, so there was no urgency to it. And he began adding up what, what is the cost of sending it overnight versus putting it in the mail, multiplied by the number of requests he gets, by how many requests I get every day, and so forth, and found that there was a, a significant amount of money being expended for that that was really quite unnecessary. So that's one example how one individual in one organization um, with better business acumen made a, a, a better decision that resulted in significant uh, financial improvements. So these are some outcomes that, that business acumen training will, will uh, facilitate. Uh, I would call these um, umbrella outcomes. First of all, uh, by, by participating in this kind of learning, uh, folks will understand how individual actions, how their individual actions and decisions affect the company's financial metrics. That's number one. You have all these uh, men and women working very, very hard today for organizations and, and doing what they believe is a great job. And they may understand or know what some key metrics are with the organization. What they have a difficult time doing, though, is drawing a line between their hard work and how that connects with the company's key metrics. This kind of training will help them draw that line. Secondly, they will appreciate and have a much deeper understanding of the tough decisions that senior leadership has to make at these organizations. And it's not like they'll necessarily agree with every one of those decisions, but they'll better appreciate the, the, the complexity of those calls that have to be made and the competitive environment in which they're operating. And lastly, they'll, they'll walk away with this training with a, an understanding of how their company makes money. Where does the cash come from? Where does it go and why? And they'll certainly understand what key financial terms and metrics mean. These, as I mentioned, are, are general, more umbrella-like outcomes. So it's important that any business acumen education also include examples and scenarios that are very specific to, to the organization itself. So it does matter how, how business acumen education is delivered. Our approach, as you can see on this slide here, has three phases, an experiential phase, a reflective phase, and a testing phase. This is just a, a couple of minutes to talk about kind of the science behind this. Um, it, it's, uh, our approach is called discovery learning. It's also known as active learning or experiential learning. It, it's learning that creates situations where learners explore new ideas, um, exercise new thinking, demonstrate new behaviors, and solve problems relevant to their positions and the work they do. There really are three phases to um, discovery learning. One is this experiential phase. In the experiential phase, the learner encounters new and concrete experiences and then deals with them in terms of observation, feelings, and, and so forth. And in the experiential phase, we break this down in a couple of, a couple of ways. It starts with uh, attracting and intriguing, um, meaning we're grabbing people's attention. So we borrow a little bit of magic and showmanship of, uh, from advertising and marketing. In the case of paradigm learning, we employ sound, we employ visuals, power openings, things like that that are designed to grab the learner's attention uh, immediately. Next is jump-starting. 
uh, where learners are given just enough information to get the experience started, just to, to whet their appetite, want them to, to, to want more. So in other words, we'll tell them, you've just bought a, a business for $40 million. Now what are you going to do with it? Um, things like that that, um, that get, the, get the, the thought processes moving and get conversations smart, starting in these uh, small teams. Um, the brain churning is part of the reflective phase in which guided small team discovery exercises get the learners involved, thinking, doing, questioning, you know, saying things like, wow, I, w I wonder why that is, or if only this, or how does that work, and, and so forth. In discovering and concluding, this is really what we call the aha stage, where learners are led to pull together conclusions and insights. And finally, when, in terms of bridging and connecting, we're talking about um, experience and insights which are bridged to the real workplace issues that they deal with and follow-up actions are determined. So in other words, they're thinking, now I know what to do, how to act, et cetera. How can I apply this knowledge to, to the, uh, the arena in which, in which I work? So all of that's a little bit about uh, some background of uh, why business acumen is necessary, how we approach the subject, one of our clients is FIS Global, as Andrew mentioned at the beginning. Uh, they're a client of Paradigm Learnings, and they have used our customized Zodiac simulation as the focal point for business acumen education. Chris Carrera, as uh, Andrew said, is a vice president of credit and commercial products for FIS Global. And uh, Chris, I'll turn things over to you here. Great. Thank you, Tim, very much. Actually, I really enjoyed going through, going through the methodology again because um, – it was, uh, oh my goodness, probably about six or seven months that um, a, a smaller team took the um, took the the challenge of attending the course, and I have to say it was it was just a, a really great experience. So once again, it was great to just kind of hear that methodology again. Um, the um, I just wanted to take some time and and tell you um, some practical um, some practical results and in, in, in how we practically took the, um, the learning from the Zodiac course and put it into practice in a very quick manner. Um, on my slide, as I, as I mentioned, that really after completing the Zodiac course, we were really all inspired to apply the learning. In fact, our executive management team challenged us to um, actually the day after to really put um, what we learned and what we experienced hands-on to the test. So we were all challenged to find an area within our working group, our day-to-day -day working group, um, to find something that has um, been broken, let's say, or a, um, an area in which we can improve. So my challenge um, was to identify some revenue gaps. So we definitely are a revenue um, generating company and everything that's predicated on how much revenue we generate and of course any lost revenue is is just a shame so what I did um, with once again with the methodology that was that um, was learned um, I identified a couple contractual products that had some big revenue drivers um, we I reviewed some of the current billing practices because I knew that there was a, a gap or I knew that there was a, a leakage somewhere just based on my month-end reports of revenue that we should be generating versus the number of customers that I had on the books. Um, I actually documented the deficits. So this is something actually that some predecessors of mine um, tried and attempted to do um, on their own. And um, I once again took the challenge that since they did not succeed that I was going to, especially once again on on uh, the heels of the learning. And I actually developed a plan to recoup the lost revenue. And this was done in a pretty quick fashion. Um, I was definitely inspired um, to, to get this done quickly. So um, the actual the challenge that I had going forward was I, um, I um, ensured that my corporation was accurately collecting for all the contractual product billings. As I mentioned, I took a look at my month-end reports and, and definitely saw that there, there is a, um, a deficit there, just doing some quick math. Um, what I did was I brought together multiple, multiple departments, so that whole collaboration effort, um, having everyone understand what my mission was, being on the same page was 
definitely something that I learned through Zodiac that we do need, you know, I do need to communicate to them uh, what the end outcome will be. Um, I actually um, um, met with some of the new sales team to understand the onboarding process, you know, how do they determine what the pricing is for the product and for that customer. Um, On the existing customers, I took a look at um, the products that they have today and some of the, the, um, I guess, the levers that we would pull to start billing for some of those features and functionality and add-on products. Um, I took a look at the customers that we were in the process of renewing their contracts and took a look at some of the negotiated rates to see if we were um, you know, increasing or decreasing the pricing. And I think one of the most important parts was also making sure that the billing codes, it sounds very simple, but the billing codes within our, our accounts receivable system were updated with the right dollar amounts, which once again, it sounds very simple, but um, really to go through that entire process to understand where the hole is, it was, it was um, very much needed. So the next, the next step um, after I identified that portion, um, I documented the current process, which once again, in order to get everyone on board and marching to the same, you know, to the same end result, I did the current process, identified the gaps so we can start fixing them. Um, Currently, there was multiple manual processes in place. So, of course, you know, single point of failure and um, sometimes from a human perspective, file sat in people's inbox when they, it really needed to be out and, um, and automated. Um, I de- developed a business case for automation. As I said, you take the human out and put the automation in when, when we could. And I recommended a new end-to-end implementation process. And as I mentioned, just going through going through the training and understanding, you know, all the business units that need to be involved and how do I bring that together, it was really developing that end-to-end process so everyone could see it. And the, the next phase was implementing the new process and not being afraid to do so. As I said, my predecessors before me, They um, attempted to do this many times, failed, and I think people just wanted to put it to bed. Um, But by implementing a new process, um, we had to notify the customer, explain why we are now billing, Um, of course, applying the first bill. um, So there was potentially an increase in billing, um, and we also had to reinforce the product value to make sure that, you know, they weren't caught off guard, but understand the product value and why we're billing. Um, the accuracy of the automated billing, which was very important. So, you know, there was a lot of checks and balances, but that is, you know, part of um, running the business. And continue to train on the new process, as I mentioned, especially with FIS. We are a very large corporation, a lot of different business units. We all have to work very closely together in order to um, make all of this work. So training was, um, was definitely a, an important process part of it. And then making sure that once we implemented it, that the audit, um, the auditing of the new billing was there and an on- ongoing kind of check of um, to make sure that the projected revenue that um, I had identified was going to come tr- to fruition. So the solution, um, the solution was is that we implemented the process and the controls. And I have to say it was in a very short time frame. Um, a lot of times we think that, you know, it can be a very laborious process, but, um, you know, when, when I'm very confident that this is the, the action that we need to, um, the, that we need to take and really focus on that, it seemed like it was more of a smaller task than it being so large, just kind of breaking down those silos. But we implemented a new process in controls um, to really eliminate the lost revenue. I have to say that we were very happy that out of the first year, um, this, once again, implementing this process, um, we recovered $3.1 million of lost revenue. And these are, you know, products and services that customers were currently using and um, just were not being billed for it. And based on the learning of Zodiac, um, as I mentioned, I did apply these following principles, which was, again, very, very important, that You know, all new contracts reviewed um, will be reviewed for accurate pricing. It's amazing how many typos can actually be 
company had on a contract. Um, the contractors are now, contracts are now uploaded into a shared location, not paper-based. Some of them were stuck in a desk drawer for years. Um, our ERP system, our SAP system, we actually have some checks and balances for product pricing. So any new product that is loaded, we, want, we need to make sure that the accurate pricing is actually loaded. Um, and we are conducting sample audits which is in our billing department, they actually, um, through the this acumen, I have actually um, extended it on to some other business units that were not part of the Zodiac training, but now I am teaching them a new way of conducting business. Um, and then projected earnings versus monthly revenue targets. You know, knowing what your projected earnings are will definitely give you um, an indicator to see if you're meeting those monthly revenue targets, which now that I know, um, now that I know the, um, I guess the universe of, you know, our billing potential, by just going through that exercise, I am pretty confident now um, in understanding, you know, my, my targets and where we need to, what, what we need to hit. So the conclusion um, of really my, my case study is the implementation of a new billing process was definitely a success. Um, as I mentioned, 3.1 million is not, is not too bad. We were very proud of that. Um, the new billing practices, they were implemented and they are here to stay. Um, I'm sharing this methodology and this tool throughout the whole organization and I catch myself doing that quite a bit. And I guess the great part is I see you now other people doing it. So it's, it's been great and I have a smile on my face every time I, I see folks, you know, kind of taking the same approach that I am now towards running a business. Um, in providing the mentorship and guidance related to this principle, it's not, you know, mandating, it's um, leading by, um, you know, by example and really showing the other business units that working together, identifying that goal, understanding the basics of finance and um, you know, where the profit can be had and doing a little bit of cleanup and, as I mentioned, not being afraid to attack what was deemed a very large, messy project into a structure to which you could implement in a very timely manner and, and achieve the $3.1 million. Um, I think the other really cool part to this, which I don't have in my conclusion, is is I'm applying this to other products. So we manage many, many products within within FIS. This was just one of them. So taking the learnings and applying them to my other 35 at this point in time, we are just kind of racking up that dollar amount of what that lost revenue was yesterday and what we're recovering today and putting the rest of those products back onto this this new framework that we built. And that is actually the conclusion to my um, case study. Very nice, Chris. Thanks. Thanks very much, and congratulations. I mean, those are that's a very impressive story, very impressive results, and some great numbers. So, so congratulations. Um, one one thing I'll I'll just uh, clarify. Uh, Chris several times mentioned the Zodiac training. Zodiac is the name of our flagship business acumen simulation. So when she refers to that, that's what uh, she was talking about. We'll come back and address that toward, toward the end of this. Um, I think the other thing you take away from what Chris has just talked about is the word I kept thinking about as I listened to her is empowerment. She just felt empowered to do these things because of the, the new knowledge she had gained from an improved level of business acumen. And while, while the, the story she tells is very, very impressive, it, it's not unusual uh, when you empower people in organizations at all levels uh, with this kind of knowledge and this kind of understanding, um, it, it just opens the floodgates of creativity and, and, uh, and good things happen. So uh, thanks again. That's a great story. Uh, other other uh, to piggyback on that, we you know uh, I won't bore all of you with all these stories, but just a couple of things that I think about after listening to Chris, a very large consumer products, one of the biggest consumer products companies in the world, implemented this same program that Chris experienced, 
and the result was millions of dollars in additional cost savings, according to them. A large automaker uh, reduced inventories in several factories as a result of this kind of training. So those kind, those kind of things happen when you empower people with this kind of knowledge. So if we, if we can all agree that the business acumen improvement is important, both from a personal development point of view and from a company point of view, uh, the next thing, I guess, is what are some best practices when you're selecting business acumen training? What's the best way to, to address this subject area? Well, as we get into that, um, I would ask you to, to uh, think about it this way. Here's something to remember when you're deciding how to approach business acumen training. Many people uh, think of any finance-related training as very boring, and many others find it very intimidating. So active, engaging, non-threatening training really is the best kind. And business simulations offer a great way to engage your audience in a way that's comfortable, uh, non-threatening, and, uh, you know, dare I say it, fun. I mean, nobody said training has to be drudgery. It is fun. So uh, with that as a backdrop, uh, these are some of our recommendations when you explore uh, business acumen training. Uh, our experience has shown that uh, having a storyline that participants can relate to is really critical. So rather than lectures and PowerPoint slides, put, put them in a situation that might not be real, but is very realistic. And when you throw into that mix an element of competition, participants are even more energized um, and engaged. Um, Secondly, uh, training should not be overwhelming and, and frustrating to learners. Uh, business acumen and financial literacy are subjects that some people, as I said, find intimidating. And many people have told me after the fact that they were afraid of being embarrassed because they felt they should know more about finances than they do. Uh, so for those of you listening, just think about uh, the last time you were promoted or just think about the job you're doing now. For some early period of time in your job, you, you probably feel there are no stupid questions because you're in a new role. But after you've been in that role, uh, whether it's managing people or doing something else, once you've been in that role for some period of time, you might be embarrassed to admit you don't know much about a particular metric or a particular financial concept that keeps uh, you keep hearing about at the organization. In a simulation, uh, you're operating in a safe environment where if, if mistakes are made, no damage is really done. In fact, you learn by those mistakes in a simulation. And, and I really I can't count how many times you've had people tell us after the experience that they were initially genuinely worried that they'd be embarrassed by their lack of financial literacy, um, but how the learning process left them more confident about having you know, different, more meaty conversations with higher-ups. They felt much more comfortable talking with higher-ups about uh, some of these concepts. Uh, third, relevance is really critical. So as I said earlier, the, the simulation does not have to be real. It must be realistic. Uh, equally important, uh, the concepts being learned must be relevant to your everyday work. So there has to be a clear connection between concepts learned in the simulation and the real world in which participants are working. Um, and fourthly, uh, uh, training needs to be memorable. I mean, key questions about any training initiative, regardless of subject, is always around how much do they remember from the training and how well can they apply the learning once they get back on the job. So those are two key things you want to keep in mind when selecting your approach to business acumen training. So, in other words, make the experience as real as possible, and of course, a simulation makes it that way because you're actually doing it. So the truth is the bottom line impacts everyone, and everyone impacts the bottom line. So everybody in an organization, if you think about it, can impact either how much revenue comes in the door or how much, how much expense goes out the door. Everybody in an organization affects one or the other or both of those, how much money comes in, how much money goes out. And the company itself has a, a vested interest in having managers and individual contributors understand that the decisions that senior leaders make are difficult ones and they're complex. And if employees have that mindset, that thinking like an owner mindset, generally speaking, they're going to be more effective and productive employees. So, um, uh, before, as we, as we transition into any uh, questions that you might have for, for Chris and me, I would like to start by asking Chris a question. 
Uh, most of what she described were the, the fabulous results that, that she was able to accomplish following the, the learning with, uh, with our Zodiac program. Chris, I wonder, though, if you could address the, these last couple slides I talked about were about the methodology itself. Can you talk just a little bit about uh, how that was helpful working in, in small teams as opposed to being in, a, in an environment where you're being lectured to and watching PowerPoint slides all day? Oh my goodness! Yes, I would. I would love to because that did make all the difference. Um, when when we first entered the room, um, which was a, a very large room, and you're right, I think I was I was expecting you know a row of chairs, and we are you know sitting uh, facing a speaker, and that is where I would be sitting for the next you know the next eight hours. In actuality. I was pleasantly surprised when we walked into the room and there were these tables, right, chairs all around, and um, in groupings. So when we sat down and were instructed to um, to pull out a board and, you know, explain kind of the, the simulation of the board game, we kind of laughed, you know, as a team of four or five, because a lot of us have probably not played board games in, in so long. But... We opened it up, and the and just the interaction of um, of you know the steps and working with each of the different team members on you know within my my group, um, which we all had different skill sets. We came from different parts of the organization. We were at different levels, but when we all came together to go through the simulation. Um, we kind of took our roles, right? A, a couple of us were maybe feeling a little outside of our comfort zone at the beginning. And then at the end, though, we felt very confident that, um, once again, knowing how to run a company, um, we were all within, you know, kind of on the same page at the end. So it was definitely a pleasant surprise, the simulation, because it was hands-on. We had time to um, talk amongst, amongst the group and actually strategize. Um, some of us did not always agree with the other, but at the end, you know, the numbers kind of came out and, you know, we agreed to have a plan to win. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a great, great experience to be able to, like I said, put, you know, put um, different um, um, from a profit center to a cost center and, like I said, go through that simulation with the team and being so interactive, the time went by so fast. Yeah, good to hear. And you remind me of something else too, Chris. When you say that, when you mention the game board, um, there's some for, for those of you listening who uh, I'm sure some of you, most of us have played Monopoly, uh, but many of us have not played Monopoly for years and years and years. And if you're one of those people who have played it but hasn't played it for years, I bet you can still remember the two most expensive places on the game board. So there's something about gaming that really does uh, help from a uh, a recall standpoint, it really does get the uh, the learning ingrained in in your memory. So, uh, Chris and I very much appreciate your attendance today. So, in the time we have left, um, Andrew, do we have uh, any questions that either of us can respond to? Yes, certainly, Tim and Chris. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, for for such a great uh, case study, Chris, and 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 the context uh, surrounding it, Tim, it was very useful, and I uh, I certainly appreciated that as did our members. So uh, we've gotten a, a few questions, uh, so we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, but uh, I will remind our, our members that if you haven't asked a question yet, now would be the appropriate time to do so via the chat box. And don't forget to attach your name to your comment. So we have a question here um, a little bit around implementation. Uh, the question came from our member, and it's it's asking, uh, describe a little bit about how FIS was 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 able to roll out this training. Um, did it require outside facilitators? What tell tell us a little bit about about that um, in in a in a greater detail. And from from my side, since I was a participant, um, I was not part of the implementation. I do know. But within FIS, we have a, a team member that um, is continually looking at um, ways of improving the business. So his role is to seek out, um, you know, different, um, I guess, different learnings um, for us as managers to put ourselves through to better 
um, me as an individual as well as, you know, benefiting the company with this knowledge. So I do know that Stephen is his name. He um, he did a lot of research um, to find, like I said, the different the different um, learning tools. And then at that time, I believe he did work with Paradigm in order to bring this, you know, to reality. And um, I also know that there was, my goodness, there was a lot of us that went through this course um, within this one division of FIS. And um, so I, I do know that he was working just very closely with, with someone at Paradigm. And if I could just add a little bit to that, Andrew, um, many times organizations will cascade the rollout uh, of an initiative like this, where it'll start at a more senior level and then cascade downward. Other organizations offer uh, the, the course simply as an elective. Um, sometimes a, a particular division or a business unit is targeted, so there are any number of ways to do it. And in addition to all of that, it, it is not at all unusual for organizations to um, take part in this kind of learning when they have regional or national meetings. So if you have 100 people in a ballroom or you're expecting 300 people in for a conference for a couple of days, this one-day learning experience can be a pretty powerful uh, uh, one-day event for, for a group like that. And we've done classes um, more like we did for, for Chris's group where you've got you know 15 to 30 people in a room, but uh, at least once a quarter we're doing classes that have anywhere from 100 to 350 or 400 people in a ballroom. Excellent. Uh, okay, so here's something that, that came to mind, for me at least. I, I know uh, HCI recently uh, did a, uh, a research report uh, that came out a few about a month ago um, around empowering the HR and business partnership. And, and for a long time, we've had a, an education uh, course that uh, focuses on uh, the importance of building financial acumen. And, and we found that it's the uh, the HR business partner role that that really um, that th this is obviously very apparent and in our research we found that 43% uh, of our respondent organizations are considering um, you know starting an, uh, up with an HR business partner model that that obviously at its core is uh, emphasizing a link between you know business acumen and HR. Uh, are you seeing anything uh, re regarding that, Tim? Like uh, folks who are trying to go from, you know, sort of an HR generalist role to becoming a little bit more of an HR strategist. That one of the biggest core competencies that's missing is this uh, is this business acumen piece. Tell us a little bit about sort of the state of the field or the, the types of folks that you think, you know, whether it's role or, or area of responsibility that this type of training uh, could really fit well for. Well, we do see um, more and more HR professionals um, uh, enrolling in these kinds of courses and initiatives within, in fact, we have a couple of them pending right now, very large international companies, and they're beginning um, rollouts within the HR function. And it's, it's for some of the reasons that you, you just described, by the nature of those jobs, uh, those professionals need to be aware of how their company makes money and also to be able to interpret for the other employees they interact with, because in effect, HR people's customers are other employees and managers in that organization. So if, they, if you have an organization that, for instance, is facing some tough times, you know, there's some bad news to develop. We've had some some difficult business uh, issues crop up or something, uh, whatever happens in my particular industry has negatively impacted the business. How do we convey that in a way that's understandable to our, to our employees? And that's much better able to be done if, if you understand some of these fundamental financial concepts. Also, the other, the other thing that HR professionals do on a regular basis is they begin HR initiatives and, um, and those initiatives uh, need to be funded. So if, if I'm an HR professional and I have several initiatives that I'd like to, to get funded, I think they make sense to roll out, how do I cost justify those? What are the kinds of things I need to think about so that senior leadership will, will provide me the funding to make that happen? So in many of our business acumen programs related to HR professionals, that, that's one of the things we'll address is how to cost justify um, uh, an initiative like that. Excellent. So, so here's another question. This is for Chris. Now, now, Chris, in your in your field, obviously there are uh, 
probably a lot of folks that have a financial background. Uh, and, and so some of this stuff comes naturally. Uh, but perhaps in other, uh, other uh, experiences you've had or, or uh, maybe s- through some, uh, some peers in other, in other fields that, that you've come across, do you find that this, that this financial acumen, this business acumen piece is something that, uh, that it, if you don't have it, you're definitely at a disadvantage when it comes to connecting that, uh, that sort of uh, individual contributions to the greater business objective? And, and I will say yes, most definitely. And I've been in business, in the finance business for 25 years. So, you know, understanding um, understanding profit and loss is, is something that is ingrained in me. And, um, but what I, what I have noticed with the other divisions within SIS that may not have the finance background, but they may have the background, um, a systems background or collections or something to that effect. Um, as I mentioned, I needed eight business units really to attack the problem at hand in order to um, achieve that, you know, the 3.1 million in lost revenue in order to get it implemented and working right. Those folks that I was working with do not have a lot of the, the finance background. So it definitely empowered them. Though. It made them feel that now they understand the end result of, you know, truly what a PNL is all about. And, um, and maybe we're too um, afraid to ask in the past, you know, some of these questions that, um, that have cropped up over the years that they really couldn't answer or maybe could not follow along with a person that has finance background. So it, it, I definitely have seen that it helps my other business partners that didn't have, like I said, that finance background. But even for me that have been there for 25 years, it was great for me to get back to basics again, right? And we were all kind of on the same page going through the, you know, through the simulation together. And it made me realize that, you know, to go back and kind of relearn um, the way it, it should be done was very helpful along with everyone else. So, you know, like I said, I kind of smile when I think of, um, of you know playing this board game and what everyone learned from it at all different levels was was probably one of the best benefits. Thank you so much. Now I, I think uh, we're probably close to wrapping this up, but I, I did want to go back to Tim because I, I am intrigued a little bit about the uh, about the gamification aspect of this, and I think uh, you you know. You uh, slyly alluded to Boardwalk and Park Place a little bit ago, and I think you're right. I think that the that that uh, engagement that is in is created when when you're in that gaming environment creates that lasting uh, you know retention of, of information. So, um, tell me a little bit about customization of the program, Tim, and and how uh, when you're faced with a client that has unique uh, challenges that you're able to deliver something that uh, that helps answer and responds uh, generating those unique solutions? Well, for, first of all, of course, every business would say their challenges are unique, and, and they really are unique. Um, and the program, what really makes it effective is, is the customization. So uh, the way the program is designed is that um, the business simulation sets a foundation of, of knowledge, helping people understand basic financial terms, um, how businesses operate, how strategies impact the numbers. They're forced to think like business owners. But then the, the, the critical part is how do we take that then and connect it to the specific business for whom they work? And that's, that's where the customization process comes in. So it begins with uh, the question of who, who is the audience that you want to affect and what are the learning outcomes you're trying to achieve? Some, some clients have broad learning outcomes. So, um, you know, they want people to understand their business at, you know, a 10,000-foot level. Um, other clients want uh, their people to understand some, something very specific. We have uh, one client who uh, most of their hourly, I'm sorry, most of their salaried workers um, are paid a quarterly bonus if certain uh, numbers are hit. And senior leadership was frustrated that, that many of those um, managers didn't understand how the quarterly bonus was calculated, particularly when they had an impact on it themselves. They could impact that number. So part of the learning in that case was helping them better understand how that 
number is arrived at and the impact they personally can have on it. So the, the, the customization needs are, are different for every client. We've got a very defined development process that allows us to get at them. And then we integrate them pretty seamlessly within the simulation. So while there is a simulation and there is a, a customized exercises and customized visuals for the client, those two things are seamlessly integrated into one uh, learning experience. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I'm afraid we've wrapped up our material for uh, today, but I, I want to thank our uh, our presenters, Tim and Chris, for such a great uh, case study and uh, and context uh, around it. I really appreciate the the opportunity to uh, to share this with our members, and of course, I want to thank Paradigm Learning for sponsoring the webcast. But I would be remiss if I didn't extend the biggest thank you of all to each and every one of our HCI members who've taken the time out of the day to spend with us. We look forward to seeing you all on another webcast soon. Enjoy the remainder of your day, everyone, and let's make it a good one.